Hello, Eagles. So last time we read Odd, Weird, and Little, Toulouse had just gone through a painting class, and it seems like he's pretty good, actually, at what he's doing. And um, our main character is listening to all of the people talk about Toulouse. Some of them seem to think Toulouse is pretty cool, and some of them, of course, um, we've got our bullies who want to make fun of him. Now, it's pretty hard to be an upstander, as Miss Hips talks about in class, and um, I'm curious what our main character is going to do. Is he going to stand up for Toulouse? Is he going to be a bystander? Or is, what, what's, it, what's his job? What's he going to do? So let's find out. Chapter 5. Walking Up a Tree I climb down from the ladder and walk over to Toulouse's tree. I have to tilt my head to see him. He's sitting on the same branch with his briefcase open in his lap. He peeks around it and looks down at me. Ursula's right about one thing. He has huge eyes. Even from this distance, they're weirdly big. Hi, I say. Who, he says. Maybe who is high in French? It's me, Woodrow. Can I come up? He stares a few seconds, long enough to make me feel uneasy, then blinks a couple of times. Is that a yes? I reach up for the lowest branch, but it's too high. I hop for it. Nope. How did Toulouse reach it? I pull some cord out of my pocket. It's good to keep some nylon cord with you. You never know when it will come in handy. I have a coil of about four feet in length. I found this piece in our backyard. It's probably part of somebody's old clothesline. It's pale yellow and fraying, but still strong. I tie one end around a flat stone, then fling it up at the branch. It passes over and swings back down and conks me on the forehead. I see stars for a while, but then I'm all right. I untie the stone and wrap the ends of the cord around my hands a few times, then tug them until they're taut, and begin walking up the tree trunk, Batman style. The bark is slipperier than I thought it'd be, though. I try walking faster, but I get no higher. I'm speed skating horizontally, on a tree trunk. Meanwhile, the cord tightens and starts cutting into my hands. Above me, where it's rubbing against the branch, it starts to split. Finally, it snaps and I fall to the ground. I land on my back with a thud. I don't see stars. I see leaves, branches, and bits of sky. I think you see stars only when you get hit on the head. The fall knocked the air out of me, though. I just stay flat on my back, close my eyes, and wait for my breath to return. Woodrow? He knows my name. I open my eyes, and he's standing right next to me. How does he do that? I'm all right, I tell him. Well, not all right, but I'm, I'm not badly injured or anything. He tilts his head slightly, like he's confused. I, I fall all the time, I say. My body's used to it. I'm lucky I fell on my back, since most of the stuff I'm carrying is stuffed into my front pockets. The metal pencil sharpener, for example, and a couple of small rolls of duct tape, an empty mint tin, and a Ticonderoga, which is my favorite pencil. I do have one roll of red duct tape in my backpack, however, which didn't feel good to land on. Toulouse reaches out a gloved hand. He's holding his briefcase in his other one. I gently take his hand and pretend to let him pull me into a sitting position. I doubt he could do it. He's pretty short. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I, you know, I interrupted your lunch, I pointed at his case. He just stares like he doesn't understand what I'm saying. Your lunch, I say. Now I sound like Mr. Logwood. I'm pretending I'm eating by moving my hand to my mouth and making biting and chewing motions. Lunch? Meal? Food? I'm sorry? He lets go of my hand and takes a watch from his pocket that is attached to his vest by a chain. He squeezes it, and the brass cover pops open, which is cool. He reads the time and nods, then snaps the watch shut and slips it back in his pocket. He looks at his bil the building. The bell rings. I get to my feet and try to reach around to brush the dirt off my back. Toulouse removes a little whisk broom from inside his jacket and helps me out. The guy has cool stuff. Thanks, I say. He stops brushing and puts the whisk broom back in his coat. Your still life was... I can't think of the right word to describe what I think his painting was. It was amazing, beautiful, and surprising. Is there one word for all of that? He stares at me. I swear his eyes are big and round as the roll of tape in my back pocket. It was, you know, it was super something. Not super duper, super, um, uh, superb. He gives me a little bow.
He understands. I bow back. Chapter 6. Logwood Sings. Ms. Wolf tells me you are quite the artist, Mr. Logwood says to Toulouse when we're back in the classroom. Toulouse doesn't answer. He is an amazing artist, Monique says. You should see his painting. Of fruit, Garrett says under his breath. Hubcap snickers. Respect, gentlemen, Mr. Logwood says. Do you need me to sing it for you? No, Garrett and Hubcap say in unison. The song Mr. Logwood sings is an old one my parents listen to sometimes. Mr. Logwood doesn't sing very well, though. Then please get out your math materials while I collect some for Toulouse. Who? Toulouse says at the mention of his name. Garrett and Hubcap snicker. Mr. Logwood begins singing the old song. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, Garrett says. Hubcap, yeah, we're so sorry. Mr. Logwood ends the song. Math materials, gentlemen, he says, then get some for Toulouse. We've been studying shapes, triangles, polygons, quadrilaterals. When Toulouse gets today's handout, which is called Greater Than Right, Obtuse Triangles. He opens his briefcase and takes out a sturdy ruler with etched markings and a cork backing, a steel protractor also etched, a pink rubber eraser, and three yellow unsharpened pencils, Ticonderogas. I dig the sharpener out of my pocket. It's a heavy bronze cylinder, speaking of geometric shapes, about an inch in diameter with a sharp metal blade on the top. I love it. I'm hoping Toulouse will appreciate its fine workmanship. Would you like this to use? I ask him. The one on the wall, it's terrible. It mangles your Ticonderogas. He stares at me. Too much English? I hold the sharpener out and smile. He sticks out his gloved hand, palm up. I see the sharpener in it. He bounces his hand, weighing it. Then he picks it up with the gloved fingers of his other hand and inspects it. One of his eyes close, and I notice a strange thing. Just before his eyelids touch, a dark diagonal line appears between them, over his large iris. Does he wear contacts? When he's finished looking at the sharpener, I can tell he appreciates the workmanship. He slides one of his pencils into the smaller of the two sharpening ports and twists it. The painted skin of the Ticonderoga curls over the blade like an apple peel. I dig into my other pocket and take out the small empty mint tin, then pop it open with my thumb. It smells of peppermint. For the shavings, I say. He nods and shakes the shavings loose. They flutter down into the tin. This is so sweet, Garrett says. Touching, Hubcap adds. Two dorks in love. Dork love. Garrett makes a little kissing sound. Hubcap joins in. I suddenly wonder whether being friendly to Toulouse is such a good idea. Garrett claims Toulouse is weirder than me. If I become friends with him, what will that say about me? If I distance myself from Toulouse, maybe Garrett will finally leave me alone. Toulouse lowers his hands and stares at Garrett's puckering mouth, then pivots his head and stares at Hubcap's. Stop staring at me, freak, Hubcap says, squirming. Toulouse makes a sound with his mouth. I think he's trying to make a kissing sound, but it ends up sounding more like clicky than kissy. I think he wants a kiss, Hub, Garrett says. Hubcap. Well, he's not getting him. One. Leave him alone, Garrett, Monique says. I was going to say that, but it got stuck in my throat. Toulouse hands the sharpener back to me with a thank you nod, then takes a small notepad with a brown leather cover out of his briefcase and flips it open. He scribbled something on the pad, tears off the sheet, and passes it to Garrett. We all lean in to read it. It's fancy cursive. It reads, Avoid obtuseness. 